Yes. So I hope I'm audible. Uh, this is me, Dr. Tuthi has already introduced and I'll be speaking uh, for the next one hour on this topic, full mouth implant rehabilitation, a uh, clinical perspective. Okay. So basically I'll be speaking on full mouth implant rehabilitation. And to start with, let's have the disclaimer that this lecture is not supported by any company and I'm not having any financial understanding with any commercial organization for this presentation. Also, the cases and views expressed in my presentation are my own. Now, India-Sri Lanka relationship goes back to the mythological times. I was just having a talk with Dr. Tuthi Karan. Uh, today is an auspicious day in India where we celebrate this festival of Dasera. And this is preceded by the nine days of festival called Navratri in India. From that time, from the time of Ramayana, where it is believed that on today, on this date, Rama uh, killed Ravana and that was the victory of good over evil. And till date, we are having a cordial relationship with Sri Lanka. And nowadays we are united with something known as a game of cricket. In this part of subcontinent, friends, this game of cricket is more of a game and it's more of a religion and less of a game. And these cricketers are worshipped as dummy gods. So this is the picture of Sachin Tendulkar in place of Lord Rama. So this is how we worship our cricketers. Also, we have something common and that is the genetic makeup in this part of the continent and that genetic makeup is having certain characteristics. So what are the characteristics of Asian patients? First is deficient bone. Second is the lack of awareness and motivation among the patients. Third are the habits and fourth is the affordability. Friends, I mean, all those who are practicing will definitely agree to what I am saying. Deficient bone, lack of awareness, habits. There are certain habits which are common only in this part of the world. So you can't, you won't be seeing those habits, people having those habits in Europe and America. And then affordability. We are still under information, even after so many years after independence. And uh, it becomes a price sensitive market. So all what I'll be talking in the next one are will be more of practical aspect, how we manage the clinical scenario, how we we'll treat these patients. Not always do we have patients with good bone and ample money. So we need to compromise. And I have been practicing for the past uh, 17 years after my post-graduation and I have done a lot of consultations. And why am I talking on this topic? It is very dear to my heart. And why I've chosen this topic is because I have been into consultation practice for almost 17 years now. I've been to more than 100 clinics in metros, urban, as well as rural areas. I've done more than 250, I don't know how many exactly, but more than 250 full mouth implant rehabilitation cases. I've placed in those patients more than two and a half thousand implants, and I've dealt with constraints, complaints, complications in implants and till date I'm learning from my failures, okay? I'm also learning from sharing as well as teaching in my institute and at various places as Dr. Tuthi has rightly mentioned, and I'm trying to be a good student. So this is, uh, these are a few photographs where I've been in the last few years, I've been to different places to do different courses on full mouth rehabs. So in the due course, what we'll be talking about is okay. that there are certain- okay. Dr. Amol, uh, slide is not visible. Your slide, slide is not visible? visible? Yeah, so not shared, I guess. Uh, it should be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mode. Now is it visible? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Thank you. So there are certain points which have to be considered when we talk about full mouth implant rehabs. 
and first and foremost how can we forget the diagnosis and treatment planning i think there is some problem yes uh next comes the biomechanics in edentulous arches so many people call me and ask sir i want to do a full mouth rehabilitation cases and where do we place implants so there are certain areas certain critical areas where we are supposed to place our implants and you can't compromise on it i'll be talking about it in due course then are the prosthetic considerations the occlusion in fully edentulous arches the surgical techniques then we'll talk a bit about concepts of all on four okay but however my dear friends it is not possible to cover every each and every point in detail in maybe uh, another 50 55 minutes or so so i'll be showing you only four or five cases different all cases are different to each other okay and then i'll explain okay, sorry sorry to interrupt you again your screen went off again your present here yeah. Yes, presentation is. <clears throat> yes, we can see now. Can you see now? Yes. Uh, I don't know why it is not. Can you see? No. Yes. Fine. No, uh, I'm. I can see you, but not your presentation. Your screen is. I can see the screen. I can see the screen. Then how come some are not able to see? Some are able to see. Can you see? Yes. Yes. Uh, pro. I think the problem is if I'm uh, putting on this play button, then there is some problem. Yeah. Anyways, so uh, what I'll be sharing is I'll be sharing three critical problems that are very common in our day-to-day -day practice. Problem number one is managing aesthetics and function in deficient bone. second problem is a consulting implant practice i have been into consulting practice for more than about 15 16 years so what happens is in consulting practice when you travel to someone else's clinic and you are doing a patient then the question is how many times is it practically possible to go to that clinic and treat your patients okay so what you try to do is you try to minimize your visits and maximize your outcome if i want to travel from pune to mumbai for example it's about 200 kilometers i spend 4 hours one way driving and 4 hours coming back so 8 hours i just spend on my travel and the trip itself takes 2 to 3 hours so the question is how many times can i afford to go there and complete my care what we try to do in such situation is minimize the number of visits and maximize the output so this is one of the problem consulting implant practice another problem is patient belongs to that dentist so the patient has been checked by that dentist and i don't know what has been promised by that dentist to the patient so there are chances that sometimes what i decide what treatment plan i decide is does not match with that of the what the dentist has committed to the patient so again there are different promises done by the dentist and by the operator so that is one of the problems and uh, the third problem is uh, managing extreme bone loss cases as i said we have a peculiar set of uh, patients with different habits genetically we have less bone and uh, this habit and lack of awareness leading to bone loss if you go to europe and us then the awareness is there these habits which are prevalent in this part of Uh, asia are not there okay they are genetically strong they have genetically more bone so very rarely you will find uh, such severely resolved cases and because of awareness the patient doesn't wait till the teeth start shaking and fall on their own okay if you as a normal patient over here 
Why didn't you come all these days? He would say that I was not having any pain. Yes, I came now because the teeth have started shaking now. Or even worse, the patient say, I have never been to a dentist because I never felt like. And how come your teeth were lost? They went off on their own. They were shaking and they fell off. So when the tooth fell off on its own, just imagine how much residual bone is remaining for you to place an implant. So that's one of the biggest challenge that we face day in and day out. So starting with the first problem, managing aesthetics and function in deficient bone. We have a typical FMR case, FMIR case, full mouth implant rehabilitation case, wherein we, um, a uh, uh, patient presents with such a symptom, such a x-ray, there is hardly any bone, all teeth are shaking. And then we place an implant, we place uh, the prosthesis and we finish up the case. But not always do we have such good bone and such affording patients. Now, my first case is a female, 52-year-old female. She works as an officer in a government institute. Okay, and she comes one day with mobile teeth and bridges and she said, Doc, I'm not able to speak, I'm not able to eat and uh, I can't smile because uh, my teeth are bad. So I want something, but the problem is I can't go to the office without teeth. And this is what she has. She is wearing a gum stripper and acrylic partial danger. Okay, and, uh, so the problem is social awkwardness and biggest problem is I can't send her to the office without teeth. So I have to think of something out of the box. Now in this case, if I remove, we all know that this is a failing dentition, we have to remove all her teeth and then place implants. But can we load these implants immediately? She can't go without teeth. I am against giving a complete denture, a removable complete denture to a 52 year old female who is working as an officer in a government institute. So she will not accept a removable denture, right? Even if it's a complete denture. So we have to give something fixed. How do you do that? Let's see. So what we did in her case was, this is the intraoral situation. So how many implants should we place? What is the minimum number of implants? So many times we have this question. So the people who are not too much into full mouth implant rehabilitation and sometimes even my students or the clinics where I go as a consultant, they call me up and ask me, Doc, how, what is the minimum number of implants that we can give in a particular case? Or I have a case where the patient is not affording so many implants. So what is the minimum number of implants? And patient wants fixed. Now there are these are two different things. My question is, why do we have to always try to place minimum number of implants? I am completely against it. Okay, you may call me from the old school of thought, but this is how I have been working for the past 15 years and this has worked in my hands. So there is no good reason that I should be shifting or deviating uh, from my time-tested treatment plan. Okay, so the question is, what is the optimal or ideal number of implants in a particular scenario? Okay. So this is how we went ahead with the case. Uh, we placed eight implants in maxilla and six implants in mandible. In maxilla, because there was deficient bone, we had to do bilateral sinus augmentations. Okay, uh, Mandible was uh, comparatively easier. Uh, we placed six implants. Uh, and then after extraction, of course, and place abutments and give her immediate provisionals. But as far as upper arch is concerned, what is important is, see, we have done bilateral sinus lifts. Now, in this scenario, I will not load my implants, but I have to give her the fixed provisional respiration. So what we do is we place something known as temporary implants. So these are the temporary implants. Okay. They are known as transitional implants. So three to four transitional implants in an arch is what we look at. And where do you place them? Wherever we get the bone. Wherever we get the bone, we place these implants. Their position is not critical. What is important is bicortical anchorage. If you can see, these implants are engaging the second cortex as well. 
I kept this left canine because it was not mobile. So three transitional implants and one canine. All other eight implants were placed in ideal location and submerged. Then what we do is we give a provisional, a cement retained provisional on this transitional implants and one canine. So all my major implants, the main implants lie submerged. Patient gets her teeth and I am happy that the patient is happy. For the next four months, I am not going to touch anywhere. Let these implants integrate. Four months later, what happens is, this is on the day of implant placement. You can see those transitional implants. This is four months later when we did the stage two surgery, placed healing abutments and 15 days later, this is how we get it. It's time for impression and final prosthesis. This is the uh, intraoperative view just before uh, removing these healing abutments after the healing is complete. And this is the final prosthesis. Both the arches, full mouth implant rehabilitation. We placed eight implants in maxilla, six in mandible, bilateral sinus lifts, transitional implants. Now what happened to these transitional implants? After four months, my implants, the root form implants, they have integrated. So it's time that they are loaded. So what do I do with the transitional implants? We have two options. If these transitional implants are integrated and they are in a good position, we can use them as an additional support. If they are integrated, but they are not in a good position, then what we do is we cut them off at the bone level. Now you can see this implant, it was placed right in the center, midline. So if I use this as an additional support, I'll have a horrible aesthetics. So what I decided, and it was integrated, so there was no point in taking it out. So I just took a carbide burr and trimmed it off at the bone level. The other two implants, they were slightly mobile. So we removed them. They did not integrate, so we removed it. But my purpose is solved. Out of three implants, they all of them lasted for four months. My job was to keep those implants and the provisional restoration for four months or maybe five or six months till I complete the final processes. So from within six months, we came from here to here and minimum visits, just six visits in six months and patient got all her teeth back. It's been more than three years now. This case was done early in 2017 and today we are almost at the fag end of 2020. So it's been more than three years. The patient is happy. I am happy and this is how I treat my cases. We can see that there are eight implants in maxilla and six implants in mandible. And this is, I'm doing this, practicing this uh, strategy for the past about um, 2006, I think I, th I did my first full arch case. And since then, this is my strategy, minimum seven to eight implants in maxilla and six implants in mandible. So what are the other options? One option is tilted implants, all on four, all on six. Another option is submerged implant with conventional complete dentures at provis as provisionals. And third option is basal implants. I don't know how much basal implants in practice in Sri Lanka, but so few people in India do basal implants. It is a treat valid treatment option in indicated cases. I will show you one of the cases in the presentation as well. So coming to the first option, all on four, all on six, that's tilted implants. Now, as I said, we practice in a price sensitive market. Now, if I'm placing, see all on four for maxillary arch, I'm not very uh, keen on doing it. It's a compromise treatment plan. We'll come to all on four. All on six, that means tilted implants. Whenever you are placing implants so tilted, the first and foremost requirement is we have to give multi-unit abutments. Now, as I said, it's a price sensitive market. Six implants, six multi-unit abutments, six castable abutments and a screw retained prosthesis. How much do we charge for the patient? The cost of a multi-unit abutment is almost as much as that of an implant. So you are not saving anything on it definitely. So six implants plus six implants, you are uh, spending on multi-unit abutments. You are spending close to equivalent to 12 implants. And then you have to give a screw retained prosthesis 
so it becomes very difficult uh, economically, not very viable option unless the patient is paying you that much. Okay, so uh, what I feel is instead of, I mean, if you are placing six implants and then six multi-unit abutments and spending so much, whom are you working for? It's a practical question. I mean, I, I'm a hardcore clinician. I'm not talking theory. I'm not publishing this article in any of the journals. Okay, practically, whom are you working for? Your patients, your family, or for the implant company? You need to ask this question to yourself. I work for my patients. I work for my family. I don't work for implant companies. So I will try to place more implants, eight implants. I mean, how does it matter? Instead of spending on 12, six implants and six multi-unit abutments, I would rather place eight implants and be safe and secured and have a good peaceful sleep at night. 10, 12 years back, if anybody was would have asked me, uh, would you go for all on four, all on six? I would probably have said yes, because I was younger by 10, 12 years at that time, new to practice. And because of the rush of blood, your attitude is come what may I'll manage. With time, your priorities change. Now my priority is to have a peaceful sleep at night. I don't mind placing two implants more and having a good sleep at night. That's, that's one of the uh, most important priorities that in my life. So, and plus I'm saving on my money. I can probably give the additional benefit to the patient, some discount to the patient if the patient asks for rather than paying the implant companies. Second option is submerged implant with uh, conventional complete dentures at provisional. I am completely against giving removable prosthesis on a submerged implant. Why you are submerging an implant? Because probably the stability is less or bone is soft or implant is placed in grafted bone, like what we did in this case. Implant to four implants out of eight were placed in grafted bone. So I can't load those implants. And if I give a removable prosthesis on it, which is supported by the underlying mucosa. This mucosa is compressible. So my denture will eventually exert pressure on the underlying implant. What's the sense in submerging those implants now? Some people may argue that, no, I relieve the denture from the tissue surface. Yes, you can relieve the denture. But my dear friends, if you really have to relieve the denture so that the implants are not loaded at all, then you have to trim minimum four millimeters of acrylic resin from the tissue surface. And if I take out four millimeters from the tissue surface, what is the remaining thickness of your denture? Will the, will the denture survive for the next four or five months in the patient's mouth? I don't think so. There won't be any contact of the denture with the underlying ridge. As such, these dentures are notorious as far as uh, stability and retention is concerned. So if you are trimming the denture four millimeters, relieving four millimeters from the tissue surface, I doubt how much will, how much retention you will achieve. So removable prosthesis on submerged implant is out of question. Basal implants, uh, in my practice, basal implants is the last option. When I feel there is uh, no way I can do any grafting procedures and there is absolutely no bone, I'll show you a couple of cases, one case at least. Uh, wherein uh, it was an indicated case for basal implants and we went ahead with the basal implants. So that is how we uh, deal with the situation. Now the second scenario is consulting implant practice. That is the number of visits is equal to economics. As I told you, when we consult, go for as a consultant to a different practice, then what we have to think of is our number of visits. We can't go there 20 times and call the patient 20 times. That is waste of time and money. Time is money. So that's waste of money. So what we do is we try to maximize the output in minimum number of visits. Now see this case, uh, elderly female, uh, she was close to her 70s when I saw her. This case was done in 2012, almost eight years back. And uh, failing dentition, everything had to be removed. So uh, this is the intraoral picture. So I'm sorry for the quality of this photograph. These are like eight year old uh, case. Yeah, uh, done in consultation. Again, so many uh, restraints. I'm operating someone else is uh, shooting it. So this is the intraoral picture. And uh, this is what we did. We placed eight implants in maxilla, six implants in mandible, 
all the cases that i am showing you i'll be showing you if you have we happen to meet sometime uh, in future you will see my cases most of them will have eight implants in maxilla six in mandible and that is that is my protocol uh, for ages now okay so we placed eight tissue level implants in maxilla six tissue level implants in mandible and uh, we gave her provisional restoration now in this case you can see that in maxilla the distal two implants are not loaded six implants anterior to this are loaded because sinus lift was done over here somehow i am not comfortable loading an implant where sinus lift is done okay in grafted bone so these implants remain submerged six implants in maxilla are loaded six implants in mandible is loaded uh, for the timing with provisional restorations of course and uh, four months of healing and then we go ahead with the uh, metal ceramic restoration after healing was complete this useless tooth was removed because it was interfering with the prosthesis and uh, then you can see the uh, now the question is why tissue level implants in the first case i showed you with bone level implants second case i am showing with tissue level implants now with tissue level implants it becomes a one stage procedure you don't have to submerge and then go ahead do a stage two surgery place healing abutment then wait for 15 months then come back with the impressions so it's a one stage procedure that reduces the number of visits okay number two there is no disconnection of components you after the implants have healed you place healing abutment you take them off make an impression place them back then take them off do the jig trial and there are so many disconnections in the due course and it has been shown in various studies that number of disconnections in the soft tissue will lead to pestle bone loss and eventual some recession of the soft tissue now in this case the collar is attached to the implant itself so whatever you are doing you are doing it supra gingivally what happens here when you are using multi unit abutments you place implants you place multi unit abutments that go into the soft tissue and then you are operating supra gingival the same thing you are doing in tissue level implants instead of using multi unit abutments and paying the company i would rather use a tissue level implant and do all my procedures supra gingivally so there is no disconnection the attachment of soft tissue with the titanium surface is by the help of hemidesmosomes it's very well maintained okay so this Im implant the, there is no disconnection of the components second is implant abutment junction is at the tissue level when you are giving bone level implants or the conventional implants then the implant abutment junction is at the bone level and then they talk about the uh, design change of an implant uh, the platform shifting to minimize the crestal bone loss and all those things okay if you are using tissue level implants your implant abutment junction as such is about away from the bone so you don't need any platform switching implants another option is if your implants are fairly parallel you can very well go ahead with abutment level impressions this is so easy you just take down these impressions of course your implants have to be absolutely parallel to that so you need to have those that skill placing these implants parallel to each other but if you can achieve that nothing like it you can just go ahead with uh, abutment level impressions and give a screw a cement retained prosthesis with an access hole above it okay so it becomes a screw cement retained prosthesis you'll save lot of money on the lab charge okay however there are certain disadvantages one is you have to give a cement retained prosthesis of course nowadays we have uh castable abutments as well for tissue level implants so that's not a problem anymore this was done in 2012 when castable abutment for tissue level implants was not available and with tissue level implants achieving aesthetics is a bit difficult why i'm saying so because you don't have any control over the soft uh, over the polished collar of an implant they come with a fixed collar of uh, 2 mm 3 mm or 1.8 mm 2.8 mm and so on so uh, normally what we do is we choose the collar head depending upon the tissue thickness in this case the implant comes with a fixed collar so you can't choose the uh, level of the margin of your prosthesis so at times you may see the polished collar in the cervical region so it is bit difficult to achieve aesthetics with tissue level implants nevertheless they are my choice 
in most of the scenarios when i go as a consultant they are my choice of implants in posterior areas even in partially edentulous cases uh, those who are into implant practice and have faced a uh, sufficient number of implants must have uh, gone through this uh, complication of implant getting slipped into the maxillary sinus when you are doing a sinus lift uh, sometime later i mean uh, at 4 months you have uh, placed the implant placed a cover screw submerged it 4 months later you take a x ray to see whether the implant is integrated and you can't see any implant and then you take a, a opg or something and then you realize that the implant is lying slipping somewhere in the sinus it must have happened i mean uh, if you have done maybe one or two even but then uh, with time this has happened with me in four or five cases where uh, my implant has slipped into the sinus during healing because of uh, fail i mean once the implant fail there are two options for that implant either come out in the mouth or go in the sinus if it is submerged uh, it's uh, difficult for the implant to come out so what happens is it may slip into the sinus the advantage of tissue level implants is these are the implants and then they have a divergent collar so even if this implant fails it cannot slip into the maxillary sinus till date most of my uh, sinus lift cases or six upper six upper seven uh, implants i place tissue level implants because i am safe as i told you my priorities have changed with time now my priority is to have a peaceful sleep at night and if i place a tissue level implants what maximum can happen that implant can fail and come out fine i'll do grafting and place another implant but at least my implant will not slip into the sinus so that is an advantage of uh, tissue level implants another advantage of placing so many implants in this case was i placed implant eight implants in maxilla when i restored you can see only seven implants in maxilla one implant failed no problem i don't have to go back and place one more implant already i have placed more than enough implants your people are talking about four and six implants in each arch i have placed eight so i can very well afford to leave two implants okay if a process is 12 minute processes can be given on six implants it can definitely be given on seven implants or eight implants so even if one implant fails i don't have to go back and repeat the procedure so that's the advantage especially in consultation otherwise i would increase two or three visits so time is money as i told you so that is why i use tissue level implants this case was completed done completely with tissue level implants all these implants are tissue level implants okay and this is the post op uh, after of completing the final process this patient is happy it's been 8 years that she is using these processes okay now the third uh, problem is managing extreme bone loss cases now as i told you one was a uh, minimum number of visits and uh, second was using tissue level implants consultation practice third is uh, managing extreme bone loss cases now see this guy he is a retired bank manager uh, 40 years of betel nut use and he has a oral submucous fibrosis i'm sorry i'm showing you on this without playing it there was a problem i don't know if i put a, a play button on then i'm not able to share my screen something i don't know so um, all this all the animation is gone anyways this guy 70 year old uh, male he complains of inability to eat he has been to um, few dentists and everybody said it's not possible for me to give you a fixed prosthesis because uh, number one mouth opening is less number two there is hardly any bone so uh, two three people referred that guy to me here in this picture you can see i mean it's a uh, it's not a very good photograph but it was maximum that i could get because the mouth opening was less okay and these are the two intraoral occlusal uh, views supposed to be occlusal views uh so what should be your treatment plan what has happened in this case is uh, maxillary teeth are missing along with the bone and the lower teeth are supra erupted as a result taking along with them this alveolar bone okay so there is a uh, compensatory supra eruption of the lower arch okay vertical uh, uh, excess of some of the alveolar ridge okay so what would you do patient doesn't want fixed we uh, doesn't want removable also we can't give a denture see what happens sub because fibrosis there is hardly any tissues of tissue uh, flexibility to hold the denture the patient will not be able to take the denture 
So we have to give a fixed prosthesis to this patient. How do you do that? So this is my protocol. Any patient coming in, walking into my practice, I take the diagnostic, uh, prepare the diagnostic cast and the diagnostic wax up. Once this wax up is done, I make a night guard that helps as a works as a surgical stent. Okay. Uh, for me to guide the position of the implants. This is the cheapest thing that we can think of, okay? Uh, making a night guard on the diagnostic wax up. And the same diagnostic wax up, I make a putty index and this helps me provisionalize the case immediately. Now, in this case, uh, we extracted those teeth first. Uh, I use these canines to stabilize this uh, surgical stent and started drilling through these holes, I place those implants. Now this case, understand the biomechanics. It's not only about placing these many implants and restoring the case, finishing off, finishing off. The most important thing is we want our implants to integrate and the process to, processes to stay there for n number of years. How do we achieve that? In this case, I told you the patient has the habit of betel nut chewing. So, he exerts tremendous forces. What happens is his masseter are overdeveloped. So imagine the amount of force he must be exerting or he will be exerting on the prosthesis, the temporary uh, restoration. It will fracture with time immediately. Okay. So what we did in this case was once these implants were placed, we used a titanium wire and welded it on the implant abutments. Now, this is known as syncrystallization intraoral welding. Okay. Now, the syncrystallization I use for immediate provisionalization. You can go back and read. I'll give you an article. It was the concept was given by and popularized by Degedi et al. It was published in 2006. And is this relevant in Asian scenario? Definitely yes. Considering the uh, habits the patients have. They have habit of chewing on hard substances. You won't, I have not seen any person uh, chewing a betel nut in US or in Europe. These habits are predominant in uh, South Asian countries. Okay, so uh, in patients in Bruxelles as well, this is, I mean, it has been the norm since last four years when I got my syn crystallization machine. All my full arch cases, I uh, weld intraorally so that all the implants are rigidly connected with each other. The advantage is because these implants are rigidly connected with each other with the help of this uh, titanium bar. Even if my prosthesis fractures during function, during healing, I don't have to worry because my implants remain integrated. Now, how many of you have done full arch cases and loaded then immediately patient comes one month later with a fractured provisional restoration? And if, I mean, you are lucky if the patient comes immediately. If the patient continues using it for a few more days and comes after six weeks and tells you since two weeks, my prosthesis is, my teeth are shaking. You take radiographs or you try to remove the prosthesis, it comes out with the implants. We don't want that to happen, okay? So the best way is to uh, rigidly splint these implants. Okay, this is an article uh, by uh, published in Clinical Implant Dental Related Restoration Research, published in 2006. Okay, uh, Degidi et al. You can read this article. He has explained it so nicely. The concept of syn crystallization. So we uh, rigidly splinted these lower implants and give him immediate provisional restoration. And my dear friends, let me tell you in the next three to four months, by the time I completed his final restoration, this guy came to me at least four to five times with a fractured provisional restoration. Implants along with the wire, the splintered implants along with the wire were intact. This prosthesis was fracturing every now and then I used to repair and place it back. I used to repair and place it back. So that's the advice, but nothing happened to the implants because they remain integrated throughout the healing period. Okay, so this is how uh, uh, it looks on healing. This is about three, min three months of healing. And you can see six implants integrated uh, nicely. Uh, the abutments are joined to each other. So we remove this, make uh, the final impression. We all know how to make final impressions. Uh, 
open tray technique okay uh, we'll talk about this canines yes i remember then these are the impressions the jig trial trial in the patient's mouth and the jaw relation once this is done the metal framework okay it's a screw retained respiration so we have this metal framework now the thing is we have these two canines which were left in place as an additional support to my implants these canines are not good okay they are carriers um, there are cervical carries on these canines so what i did was i mean we all know once the tooth is lost the bone resorbs and uh, as per mmd1 it is the perpetual preservation of what remains than meticulous restoration of what is missing so why objective always has to be to uh sorry i got a message from dr tuti karan that canine molar rule is not obeyed that was uh, what i was reading i'll come to that as we talk so uh, this canines we do not want to sacrifice those canines let them remain as it is there is no periapical problem with this so what we did was we did endodontic treatment of these canines submerge them trim them down to the bone level and this is the uh, measurement that i gave to the lab so that he can uh, fire the ceramic uh, and once this is done this is the metal trial in the patient's mouth the final restoration and you can see that the ceramic has been added in this region where the canine was uh, submerged and this is how it looks into the patient's mouth we have a screw retained prosthesis in the lower arch this is how we complete it looks good patient was a bit immature submucous fibrosis very deficient bone reduced mouth opening we gave him a fixed respiration for as far as upper jaw is concerned this jaw was treated by one of my good friends he is the boss in uh, basal implants that's why i'm not showing uh, uh, the entire uh, surgical procedure for the upper jaw his name is dr vivek gaur he managed the upper jaw with uh, basal implants and this is how we completed the case you can see the two canines uh, submerged and six implants 10 implants in maxilla this is the concept of basal implants we engage the cortices the second cortices always and uh, that was the only way i could have done this case because there was no bone in maxillary arch theoretically we can do block grafts we can do mesh we can use titanium reinforced uh, cytoplast uh, membranes and do a gbr and do bilateral sinus lifts and what not my dear friends this patient was 70 year old with reduced mouth opening sub mucus fibrosis how do you manipulate the flaps very very difficult all said and done it is practically not possible my father is 72 years old if he comes with the same uh, condition i would not would, my question is would you do this for your parents with this condition sub mucus fibrosis at the age of 70 would you go for graftings and 6 months without teeth and then go ahead with i mean it's it's practically not possible for full mouth we rarely do extensive grafting procedures with that age okay there are certain limitations so as at the starting of my lecture i had mentioned that i'll be talking what is practically possible in your practice yes what are the op other options as i said we can do all on four we can place zygomatic implants zygomatic implants 30 35 mm long do we have that much of mouth opening no all on four where is the bone for all on four there was no bone and why all on four in a bruxer in a patient with a betel nut chewing with a hyperactive masseters no okay gbr and conventional implants we already has discussed in maxilla it was not possible mandible it was possible whenever possible i go for conventional implants so habits do not always lead to bone loss sometimes the loss of tooth structure as well now uh, see what happens uh, in this case now this guy he is a doctor okay betel nut chewing he has quit it now but he has got severely worn out anteriors there is passive eruption so this is how he comes up with i am not removing all his teeth in both the jaws but see what happens is he has a kennedy's class 1 situation bilaterally distal extension in mandible okay completely worn out teeth in mandible maxilla we can see some teeth okay 
but if you can see this occlusal plane it's wavy it's not straight okay he comes of sensitive uh, complaints of sensitivity as well so we need to treat him treat his sensitivity we need to adjust the occlusion as we have discussed in the initial slides that uh, one of the points key points in full mouth rehab is uh, establishing proper occlusion so what we did in this case also what had happened is now when these teeth are completely atridae what happens there is something known as passive eruption to maintain the vertical distance by na the nature tries to compensate that loss of tooth structure by supra erupting these teeth supra erupt and when these teeth supra erupt they carry the dento alveolar complex along with it the alveolar bone also supra erupts so we have more of alveolar bone so if i just remove these teeth and place implants where is the restorative space that is one important consideration in full mouth you just can't increase a bite people say you raise a bite you can't raise a bite you have to restore the lost vertical dimension okay so in this case patient had not lost vertical dimension because of passive eruption he has been uh, you uh, eating that betel nut for 30 35 40 years and over a period of time these teeth got atridated and uh, there was a compensatory supra eruption there was no loss of vertical dimension so then i when i place an implant i have to think about the restorative space so how do you gain that restorative space is you remove the excess bone you do a crestotomy remove the excess bone obtain a sufficient restorative space crestotomy also helps in uh, get a good width of the bone okay so what we did was we raised the flap this case was done in september 2017 it's been exactly 3 years now we raised the flap did crestotomy we got a good flat bone sufficient restorative space to place six implants uh gave him immediate provisional restorations once the implants integrated we removed this provisional restoration place the impression post splint them take a open tray impression and the subsequent steps of jig trial placing the jig trial in the mouth verifying the fit on the radiographs the jaw relation we have screw retained record basis temporary record basis for obtaining the stability and then a wax rim on the screw retained basis okay so and uh, then uh, this is the jaw relation the wax trial danger meanwhile during this healing phase i treated this upper arch if you can uh, notice this you have a good occlusal plane and all teeth are having a good gingival zenith because the patient has had a wavy occlusal plane teeth were sensitive because of atrition we did endodontic treatment of those teeth i did some crown lengthening procedures for these anteriors and uh, crowns and uh, bridge on one left side upper left six uh, second first molar was missing so we made a bridge over here and separate crowns for all other teeth and got a good occlusal plane see so this was during the provisional phase and uh, meanwhile the implants integrated we go ahead with the again this trial denture is screw retained you can see the access holes over here and once this access uh, trial denture is approved by the patient the next step is we have to duplicate these contours in the final restoration how do you duplicate it you make a putty index of course the lab good life you send it to a good lab lab person does it so he makes a putty index of your trial denture and once this is done he duplicates it in the <laughs> so uh, in this case we had decided to go ahead with a zirconia bridge so it's a one piece zirconium bridge uh, milling is done this is how the bridge looks like and then uh, the trial uh, in the patient's mouth this putty index is what is used by the uh, technician as a reference while he is firing the uh, ceramic on this framework and this is the final restoration and the final restoration in the patient's mouth this is the maxilla and the mandible and this is the final smile so we came from here to here you can see the occlusal plane is adjusted you got sufficient restorative space place adequate number of implants in uh essential areas and uh, did crestotomy and gave him a fixed prosthesis
So what did we do? It was immediate placement. We did crestotomy to gain restorative space. We gave immediate provisional restoration. We established the maxillary occlusal plane in the meanwhile, and we gave him a screw retained milled zirconia restoration. So we have addressed three critical problems. One is managing aesthetics and function in deficient bone. That was the first case, lady. Second is consulting implant practice, again lady, but with uh, tissue level implants. And third is extreme bone loss case, uh, where we placed basal implants in maxilla and uh, conventional implants in mandible. The fourth, fourth case was uh, more of an ideal where we have sufficient bone, but treatment planning is very critical because uh, you just can't extract a tooth and place an implant. You need a restorative space as well. So we created the restorative space. So that was our fourth case. Okay, now as Dr. Tutikaran was saying that uh, I have violated the canine and molar rule. Now, Dr. Tuti, uh, he is a very, very close friend of mine. The Bedrosian classification of placing at least one implant per segment is applicable in maxillary arch. So, in the first two cases where I had shown you. Uh, uh, maxillary implants, uh, there you could see the implants were always placed in first molar, the implants were always placed in canine, and they were always placed in central incisor region. So this Bedrosian classification is applicable in maxillary arch and not in mandibular arch. According to Bedrosian, the maxillary arch is divided into five segments. The four incisors is one segment. Canine, each canine is a segment in its own. Two premolars and the first molar is on each side is one segment each. So we have five segments. And what he says is we need at least one implant per segment. So we have to place at least five implants. Now five or six or seven or eight, five is minimum. More implants. Now if the bone is soft, place more implants. If occlusal forces are high, place more implants. If the bone volume is less, you are compromising on the size of implants, place more implants. If your angulation is not favorable, place more implants. If the patient is having a maximum mandibular relationship or class two uh, relationship, place more implants because then there will be more of cantilever. So to compensate that cantilever, you have to place those implants. Okay. So Bedrosian classification, placing minimum five implants, one implant in each segment, and I molar rule app applies in maxilla deficit. Okay, and it's not applicable in mandible because generally mandible we don't have that much of an angulation problem. The density is better in maxilla mandible. Mandible is enclosed within, uh, contained within the maxillary arch. Maxillary arch normally is um, wider as compared mm -hmm. to mandible. Okay, yeah. so, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Factors that are considered uh, when you are planning a full mouth implant rehabilitation. I hope, Dr. Tuti, I have answered your doubt. Okay. Now, not always do we give a full, uh, when you are treating a full mouth implant, do not always do we give a fixed prosthesis. There are times where you have to give a removable prosthesis. One of the most important consideration in this is the aesthetics, the lip and cheek support. If there is a lot of resorption and patient says, I want a fixed prosthesis, you can't. Because if there is a lot of resorption, the lip and cheek are in like this. You need the prosthesis to support the lip as well. And how do you gain a support to the lip? With the help of a flange. And if you are giving a flange, can you give a fixed prosthesis? No. So keep that always in your mind when you are planning a full mouth implant case. Don't always think patient cannot afford, so I am placing less number of implants and I am giving him a or her a removable prosthesis. The choice of prosthesis doesn't depend upon patient's affordability. It depends upon the presenting intraoral condition. The restorative space, the lip support, the cheek support, that is what determines whether you can give a fixed or removable prosthesis and not the patient's pocket. Okay. So in this case, money was not an issue. But lip support, cheek support, inter the restorative space was an issue. There was too much of restorative space. So we went ahead with uh, four implants, bar and clip dentures. So these are over dentures. Now see this case. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. In this patient, if I give a fixed prosthesis, she needs, she needs lip support. Okay. And can you get a lip support without a flange? 
No. If I give a flange, can I give a fixed prosthesis? Again, no. So in this case, I gave her an over denture with a flange, and this is how she looks. This is how we improve the aesthetics. If you are placing four implants, connecting them rigidly with a bar, and then uh, giving a removable prosthesis, it will be pretty comfortable. Patient will uh, remove it only when he or she wants. It won't be loose also. So this is how we treat it. In this case, a removable prosthesis is indicated when lip and cheek support is required. So this is the integral surface of the denture. Four implants were placed, bar, and these are the two clips that are placed onto the bar. So patient just uh, has to pull it, the denture out, and then the denture comes. So where do we place these implants? These implants are have to be placed interforaminally. What are the lap steps? Same as uh, the ones for complete denture. Only thing is we have to pick up these cli uh, clips with the denture. And what is the difference between the previous case and this case? This is a removable case. So this is this a case of all on four? No. Okay. So when do we go for all on four? Uh, we have, I, I have almost uh, exhausted my time, but give me another uh, 10 minutes uh, so that we can discuss a bit about all on four. Now this all on four, which is uh, one of the most widely talked about topics. Let us uh, see how it has evolved. After the first successful full mouth implant patient in 1965, discussion began around the optimal number of implants. What is the optimum number of implants uh, for a full arch case? Okay, some clinicians placed as many implants as possible. Some advocated one implant per root. If you go back to older editions of the book, you can uh, see this was mentioned. Some argued that four to six implants per arch are sufficient. I placed six to eight implants. In 2003, Doctors Paolo Molo and Bo Rangert. Paolo Molo practices in um, Lisbon, Portugal. So they introduced the concept of immediate loading of edentulous jaws with two distal tilted implants. These procedures considerably reduce the cost and time consuming grafting procedures, the number of surgeries, as well as the healing time. So, what was the need for all on four? Again, the cost, time. Grafting, elderly patients, poor bones. So all on four is given when there is severe resorption. All on four is given when you have to place an implant and restore it immediately. As far as cost is concerned, this is not applicable in our scenario because here the implant companies charge a bomb for multi-unit abutments. This all on four requires multi-unit abutments. Okay, so they reported a very high success rate. And the concept was developed because of the need to treat the patient with deficient bone and as an alternative to complex grafting procedures. Now it has become a fad these days. It has become a fad. We don't want to blindly follow it. Think before you do it. So what is the concept? You tilt the distal implants. Okay, that increases the bone implant contact, avoids bone augmentation. And uh, it also increases the anterior posterior spread. It avoids the vital structures and it reduces the cantilevers. So there are three elements. One is the immediate function. Second is the multi-unit abutment. And third is the optimal aesthetics. How do you achieve them? Immediate function. You place four implants like this. The distal two are tilted, front two are straight. So because of tilting, you are increasing the AP spread. You place longer implants, 10, minimum 10 millimeters long. You get a good stability. You are avoiding uh, structures, no grafting. When you get good stability, when there is no grafting, you can load your implant immediately. Then to correct this, because these implants are placed at different angulations, you correct these angulations with the help of multi-unit abutments. So it becomes more or less parallel. And then when, uh, as I told you, multi-unit abutments, you are taking the connection to the soft tissue level. So whatever you are doing subsequently will be at the level of soft tissue. And optimal aesthetics, when you say all on four, it is patented by Noble Biocare. So you have to use Noble restorations. When you say that it's an all on four concept remains same, you can use any implants for that, okay? Coming to biomechanics, it is taken care of. People say that mandibular flexure affects the long-term um, uh, bone levels of your uh, peri-implant bone levels. So if these implants are placed interforaminally, there is no question of mandibular flexure. Implants are long, so you get very good primary stability. Implants are tilted, so you get a good anterior-posterior spread. You are splinting all these implants together. 
so there is good stress distribution and then you are giving a screw retain processes that facilitates the retrievability of the processes okay so these are a few most important step you need to have minimum 35 newton centimeters of torque no para function there has to be minimum of 5 millimeters of bone above the mental foramen all implants need to be splinted okay posterior implants can be tilted to a maximum of 45 degrees see it's such an exacting procedure it can't be used loosely for all the patients okay implant has to be at least 4 millimeters in diameter not more than one tooth can be cantilevered and not more than 12 teeth should be replaced opposite arch should not have natural teeth see these are very very important considerations in all on four you just can't go ahead and do a all on four case okay just because you want to do it and this is the all on four guide you can see these vertical marks okay they guide you as far as the angulation of this implants is uh, concerned the front two implants are placed parallel to this so they are vertical the distal two implants uh, they bisect these two points diagonally okay say so they go across this and so you get an angulation of about 45 degrees so this is how it is done you place this guide or alternatively you can use a surgical stent and then you place the distal two implants first so this is what i was talking about your drill will bisect this segment diagonally bisect so you get a proper angulation you have to raise a flap to uh, see the mental foramen and you have to go 5 mm ahead of the mental foramen verify the angulation and uh, yeah the one last case that i want to show you this case upper arch is completely edentulous lower arch is severely resorbed you can see there is hardly 5 mm of bone above the mental foramen okay so in this case and she is a thin frail female how much force will she exert not much okay so we can go ahead with a all on four case i don't want to do any grafting procedures here patient is where will be wearing a complete denture in maxillary arch so four implants is what is more than enough so this is how we go ahead place the guide place four implants and uh, the multi unit abutments the temporary abutments you can see the x rays and then we give a immediate provisional restoration okay a fixed mandibular denture the existing complete denture is converted to a removable uh, denture remove the cantilevered part okay you can see good ap spread four implants the tissue surface has to be nicely contoured it has to be convex and uh, it's a screw retain process now what happens is uh, it happens in india i'm sure it must be happening in sri lanka as well now this patients they don't pay completely in the first visit now this patient also did the same thing she paid me in part and she conveniently forgot i called her after 4 months for the final prosthesis and she conveniently forgot and didn't uh, come to me for 9 or 10 months one fine day she calls me up doctor my denture is fractured i said madam this is a temporary denture and you have to get the final one done and you have to complete your payment as well and uh, so she had to come back and when she came back why you why she called me was because of this the denture was fractured it's an acrylic how long will it stay and it's fixed so naturally once it is fixed the occlusal forces will be more so then she came to me she paid me the balance amount and then i went ahead with the uh, impression and subsequent procedures so that's all what i wanted to share with you in this given time uh, i have already exceeded the time we need to have some time for question answers so we have almost 10 15 minutes remaining now so what i want to uh, convey here is aim for success not perfection never give up the your right to be wrong because then you will lose your ability to learn new things and move forward in life uh, i thank the sri lankan dental association dr tuthi karan for giving me this opportunity to express my views in front of you all and uh, how can i forget you all for uh, your time on sunday evening it takes a lot uh, convincing your spouse to be away from them for one and a half hour and thank you very much for that thanks and i think now we'll have uh, some question answer session as well yeah thank you very much dr amol uh, we have received few questions yeah so we will Can we take it one by one? Yes. 
uh, the first uh, question is, when you say temporary implant, are they titanium or stainless steel? Temporary and are we talking abutment. about Sendex MDI? Uh, temporary abutments? Temporary implants. Temporary implants are titanium. They are transitional implants. They are narrow one piece implants. They are uh, made of titanium. Only thing is their surface is not treated. So we are not talking about Sendex MDI. Sorry? Sendex MDI mini implants? No. Oh uh, no no. See this transitional implants, implants, but mini implants have their threads which are surface treated, rough sandblasting, acid etching, oh. because they are supposed to stay there. They are supposed to osseo integrate. Transitional implants are smooth surface. They have the threads for stability, but their surface is not treated. It is a smooth machined surface. So they are supposed to stay there only for a few months. Okay. Your second question is, your prosthesis in the maxilla and mandible in a full large case, is it in, when you have eight implants or six implants, is it one piece or it's segmented one prosthesis? One piece, one piece. Maxilla, there is no question of giving a segmented prosthesis. Why do you want a segmented prosthesis? We see in biomechanics that you need to splint. If you are placing multiple implants, adjacent implants, your implants need to be split, splinted for a proper stress distribution. Then why split a prosthesis? All right. As far as mandible is concerned, there was an argument that uh, this, uh, if the implants are uh, placed posteriorly because of mandibular flexure, you can have some crestal bone loss. But if you can go back and uh, this is already recorded. So if you go back and see my implants, none of the implant is placed distal to first molar. In fact, these implants are placed in the mesial root of the first molar. So that, that is just beyond the mental foramen and maybe half a tooth is cantilevered. So that's fairly fine. I mean, the, uh, I have uh, initial years going by the books. I used to split my prosthesis, mandibular prosthesis into two. But over a period of time, I realized that it is not required. So last, I think, uh, 10 or 11 years, uh, all my cases, I have given one piece prosthesis in mandibular arch and uh, I have not seen any failure or any complication in those cases. Right. Thank you. Yes, if you're placing your implants in second molar region, and you are giving second molar to second molar, then I would definitely split the prosthesis somewhere uh, anterior to the mental foramen to allow for mandibular flexure. But in <clears throat> first molar region, I don't think there is so much of a mandibular flexure. So I don't uh, split my prosthesis. That was a wonderful answer. Uh, the Another question is like, uh, when you are doing a sinus lift procedure, what would you like, direct or indirect uh, for your cases? Uh, see, as per books, they say that up to five millimeters and more of residual bone height go for a crestal approach. You can go for a crestal approach, of course, if there is no septum in between. Less than five millimeters of residual bone height, they recommend uh, doing a lateral approach, lateral uh, sinus window and putting a cap. But uh, as we have seen us working, we have been working for a few years now together. Uh, even in two or three millimeters of bone, if you have good skilled uh, hands and you have good control on your drills with uh, the use of uh, osseodensification drill protocol and uh, uh, delivery system of your grafts, uh, doing a crestal approach has become fairly more predictable. So nowadays, very rarely it happens that I go for a lateral approach. Most commonly, I go for a crestal approach. All right. So there are a few more questions from the participants. How long do you wait after an extraction to place an implant? Immediately. Why do you have to wait? Okay. Uh, if there is a huge periapical lesion, see, only time I wait to place an implant is when I feel I won't get enough primary stability. In a full arch rehabilitation cases, there is uh, there are very few instances where you can't get good primary stability. Uh, the question you have said uh, mentioned that it's slide twenty nine. While you could uh, look at slide 29 to answer this question, you may yeah. also answer another question. What is your view, experience on use of osseodensification? It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Osseodensification, yes. Uh, we have gone to uh, slide number 29 here. See, if I have an option of placing my implant in a healed bone, I would go for it. If I don't have that option, I will go through the socket. Now, here you can see this implant is in the extraction socket. 
this is the second premolar this is the first molar okay uh, this implant i think uh, again is in the uh, this is in the healed bone this is the extraction socket so whenever possible try to avoid extraction sockets place your implant in a healed bone when you know that the water is too deep and you can't swim swim properly why do you want to take a risk of diving in it but if you don't have any option and you know only partly swimming and you don't have any option you will die otherwise then you have to jump and try swimming right so uh, whenever possible place your implants in a healed bone if not possible uh, it's not that you can't uh, place implant in extraction sockets you can only thing is uh, if there is periapical lesion you have to ensure a thorough debridement your drilling protocol has to be such that you ensure a good primary stability right. so that's the only thing and uh, yes and when you are placing multiple implants and you are splinting them immediately uh, these implants are not moving at all they will eventually heal see what happens over here absolutely fantastic healing of all these extraction sites right there's one more question the last question probably if generalized periodontal disease how long do you wait uh, in a full edge case how long do you wait after removal of teeth so uh, i wait uh, you know perio case where all the teeth are mobile then and we have to uh, remove all those teeth where what i do is i generally remove the teeth do a total extraction and give a provisional complete denture to this patient telling the patient that this is a provisional restoration this is only temporary meant to be there for 4 to 6 weeks till the soft tissue healing is achieved till the inflammation of the soft tissue subsides okay Uh, i think 4 to 6 weeks is more than enough i don't have to wait till the bone heals because in these cases these sockets are hardly deep a couple of millimeters deep in perio cases you are talking about so there is hardly any socket so question of primary stability doesn't arise over here what i want is i want to reduce the bacterial count in the patient's mouth and achieve some soft tissue closure and so 4 to 6 weeks are enough for soft tissue healing yeah so 4 to 6 weeks is more than enough meanwhile you can give a complete denture and then you can convert the same complete denture into a provisional restoration a fixed pro retained provisional restoration hello yeah yeah we are there so we are so actually we have exhausted our time and we have shifted to another one hour and 20 minutes so if if any of the participants have questions you can place more so uh, also i can uh, probably we'll do one thing i'll give you my uh, email address phone number and email address yeah that will be fine so this is my phone number and uh, and this is my email address so any doubts you can contact me on this number or on this uh, mail just make it a little bigger it's not clear okay is it all right yeah that's clear now yes so my uh, phone number and my mail and i'll be more than happy to uh, be of any help uh, whoever requires whenever it is required and hope to see you all sometime in india or in sri lanka once this pandemic gets over next year next year or maybe in 2022 Whenever uh, Doctor Tuti invites me to, uh, thank you very much, Doctor Amul. Uh, I know you are a very busy person, but uh, uh, always traveling around and uh, doing a lot of lectures. In which time you found uh, some time to spend with us, 
thank you so much for your cooperation being a festival day you choose to spend with us and uh, not with your family Thank you.